Okay, uh, <clears throat> today we'll talk about um, the architecture of Venice or Venice architecture uh, from a certain uh, perspective. That is, I, I will show works by uh, very important architects, both from the past and the present, who built in Venice. And this uh, presentation is particularly uh, addressed uh, uh, to those who would like to visit Venice this year because of the uh, biennial in architecture. So let's see what this uh, great city has to offer. And it has to offer a lot. I mean, I could have made a presentation just about the cemetery of Venice, uh, where a poet like uh, Joseph Brodsky wanted very much to be buried and um, with good reasons, because uh, there are some, uh, I mean, Venice is Venice. It's almost an imago mundi in our fragility, you know, and in our, uh, you know, uh, presumed uh, beauty. It's, it's, it's a quintessential city in terms of art, architecture, beauty, but also vulnerability, fragility. We begin with Baldassar, Baldassare Longhena, who is not, although he built uh, important buildings in, uh, in Venice, but he is not, I don't think his uh, spirit is, uh, is um, in, intrinsically, uh, um, um, you know, a Venetian, because he is a Baroque architect, and 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 the Baroque. Although I'm I'm probably wrong now. I, I have to be careful with what I say, because there is also a Baroque, a Baroque uh, uh, sensibility in Venice. But let's see what uh, Longhena uh, did. Uh, there are various portraits of him. I'm not even sure this is him. Sometimes the identification of of, uh, of uh, characters or architects is uh, is wrong on the web, but I I presume it is him. This is his most important work in Venice, Basilica di Santa Maria della Salute, or simply Santa Maria della Salute. It's hard to miss it because it's a very uh, you know, uh, visible uh, large building, and it stands out also because of its baroqueness, because it is a baroque uh, baroque building. And here it is. Um, it's 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 a building that uh, uh, that uh, stands out. And I hope I have here an image from the top. Let me see just a second. Yeah, here. So you see, here is uh, Piazza San Marco, of course, and here is the uh, Santa Maria de la Salute by Longhena. And, and here, the building on the left is a building where is the only work by Tadao Ando in Venice. But the building existed prior to Tadao, Tadao Ando, but he worked inside the building. Unfortunately, the entrance into this building, if you want to see the work of Tadao Ando, uh, the ticket to enter is expensive. I know I, I was discouraged to, to pay that amount of money. I don't know, 25 euros or something like this. Um, anyway, if you see, if you go to Venice and you see uh, the building by Longhena, you can, you can very easily go and see the work of Tadao Ando, which is in this building. Uh, but let's, uh, let's start with the beginning now that I anticipated a little bit. So this is the building, an octagonal um, the plan. And the octagon uh, was used uh, by uh, uh, various very important artists and architects. Leonardo da Vinci was almost obsessed by the octagon. He used it frequently in his architectural sketches, although he didn't build uh, Leonardo. But the octagon is, is, is present in many important architectures and Longhena uh, used an octagon, uh, octagonal uh, plan for this um, celebrated basilica. Baroque architecture. 
again, I, 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 I'm not sure that this building represents Venice in its most uh, intense specificities, but it's a, it's a, it's a building that uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is important for Venice and uh, it stands out, as you can see. And uh, so I, I start the presentation with it. Although again, I think the spirit of Venice is a little bit different than this kind of uh, uh, Baroque architecture. Here on the left, we see a building by Palladio. Uh, and uh, there are two churches built by Palladio. We are going to see them in you know, detail. This is Il Redentore, but uh, there is also San Giorgio Maggiore a little bit on the left. Of course, you take the, the Vaporetto, you take the, the boat, the ship, the boat, uh, you know, that crosses the canal and, uh, and, uh, and yes, there it is Palladio, but if you want to see Palladio, you just take the train from Santa, from, uh, Santa Lucia, the train station in Venice, and in one hour you are in, 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 in Vicenza, and in Vicenza you have, <laughs> Almost all the buildings are by Palladio. I exaggerate, but there are many buildings by Palladio, some of his most important buildings. Anyway, the octagon of, uh, although this is the octagon, it is an octagon, but it looks as if it has more than eight sides in this picture by Longena. Uh, I went several times to Venice, but I never <laughs> managed to enter the building because Every time I, I, I went there, uh, it, it was closed. Anyway. Baltasar Longena. And again, this is the, the urban fabric of, of Venice. And you see where it is located. And uh, of course, for tourists, the main attraction is uh, San Marco. I didn't, I didn't. I, I didn't include San Marco in, 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 in my presentation, imperfect as it is. You can arrive at uh, you know, San Marco. In fact, you can arrive even to the, the Venice Biennial if you continue to walk here by the water. Approximately in uh, 15 minutes, you are at the Venice Biennial. But you can arrive here from the train station by walking. I, I always walked through through the labyrinth of Venice in order to arrive here. Uh, so again, this is Longena, uh, Baltazare Longena. And this is the building where Tadao Ando um, did his work. And we are going to see pictures of that, uh, this work um, towards the end of this uh, uh, presentation. But I like this, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, Longena and Tadawando and, uh, you know, the, the meeting, the, the meeting between the, the old and the new. I think they enhance each other and they should be like this in, in, in all places on this earth. Andrea Palladio, uh, what can we say? The quintessential architect, in my opinion, I am probably wrong, but you you cannot have you cannot have uh, you know uh, hierarchies uh, rigid hierarchies in the field of art, and I include architecture. But for me, somehow Andrea Palladio is the. No, I shouldn't say this. I, I was ready to say the best individual architect in the history of architecture. I, I shouldn't say this. So please, please do not hear what I just said. But He's together with the very best. And I love Palladio. And uh, I don't know if there are people who don't. San Giorgio Maggiore, uh, this work house facade elevation is, was actually not finalized by him. Uh, we are going to read about it a little later. So this is San Giorgio Maggiore. And uh, from Tadao Ando, you can see you can see San Giorgio Maggiore uh, very well. And on the right here is uh, Il Redentore, also by, by Palladio. To be honest with you, the, the churches of Palladio, um, 
have a, I don't know how to say, a problematic sacrality inside, in my opinion. But maybe because of my orthodox up upbringing, I expect the church to be a little bit mysterious, a little bit dark. Uh, and this is very whitish and luminous. And as you can see, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it depends on the sensibility of, of, of the viewer. I, I, I don't think the churches by Palladio are his greatest works. I think his villas are, although the Basilica in uh, Vicenza is a major work and even these are major works, but somehow I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself to what extent Andrea Palladio truly believed. Maybe he did, I don't know. I mean, he didn't leave behind poems, you know, like uh, Michelangelo, you know, where you can see Michelangelo struggling with the, with the, with the, with the tensions between uh, a desire to believe and maybe some shadows of uh, the new man, if I am to remember his David. Uh, so this is San Giorgio Maggiore by Palladio a work to be seen uh, and as i said not far from it is also il redentore so he built two churches in venice and we are going to see il redentore as well so il redentore this is the one um what can we say it's andrea palladio right i mean <laughs> you can get much better architecture uh, it doesn't matter ecclesiastical or not uh, venice benefits a lot from the proximity of water and uh, you know it's a very romantic place as you know and you know almost any building uh, is impressive because of the you know the special uh, uh, circumstance that uh, that venice is 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 is, is in this uh, dialectic with with water with the sky with the, you know and with history with art it's all, all, all these things together make venice very very special Unfortunately, many people think so, and uh, it's flooded with tourists. And as uh, Andrei Codrescu said, the tourists are terrorists with cameras. Uh, the pandemic diminished a little bit this, uh, you know, uh, immense amount of uh, people uh, flooding uh, more than water, actually. In fact, I would say uh, Venice is more flooded by people, by tourists than by water. Uh, what can you do? Everyone wants to be in Venice. Some even in uh, Domus Eterna, in, in their graves, they want to be in Venice. Venice is as an unbelievable uh, uh, attraction for, for so many people. I, I can take Venice more than, for more than three, four days. No, after a while it becomes, uh, you know, oppressive because of the multitude of people, which you do not see in these pictures, but I'm sure you know it's flooded with tourists and now that the pandemic is some say over although I think it's not totally over uh, people travel again so this is Il Redentore by uh, Palladio uh, again uh, luminous and uh, whitish inside um, uh, drawing a digital drawing done uh, recently of course kind of lifeless compared to the beautiful handmade drawings by palladio himself and by it by the way of this I, I i would i would challenge you to imagine a great architecture like certainly palladio's architecture is drawn just in euclidean terms meaning by dimensionally a plan a section as, as he usually does, half section, half elevation. That's it, no perspectives, no renderings. 
and those dra drawings are beautiful and so are the buildings can you imagine today to make a project where you express your ideas as simply yet as sensitively as palladio i i kept asking myself why is it that palladio didn't use perspective because perspective was already known for 150 years piero della francesca and brunelleschi invented the uh, or discovered the perspective a long time before Palladio. I didn't, I never saw a drawing in perspective by Palladio. Now, of course, there is the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza, which has a perspectival, um, uh, you know, uh, design, but drawings, perspectival drawings, I never saw by Palladio. And we are talking about the quintessential architect. Beautiful drawings, the drawings of Palladio. This is not by, by him, this drawing. But the drawings published in the four books of architecture are, uh, I don't think architecture can get better drawings than those. Now you see here, you know, uh, uh, it's, 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 that's Venice and it's part of the, of the fascination of this city that it's, 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 it's continuous, continuously celebrating. You know, it's like, a, it's a carnival every single uh, second, every single minute, every single hour, day and night. But the locals, and this is actually maybe a, a presentation should be made on the unknown Venice, the Venice of the real Venetians, those who are not involved in the, in the great tourism of the city. You know, those are the periphery and, and it, that, that's, a, that's another Venice and it's very interesting actually, uh, that Venice. But now we look at masterpieces, we, we look at the jewels of Venice and, and I chose to talk about them. Uh, what can we say? Um, Il Redentore is Il Redentore and it looks beautiful through these branches of the trees from the back. Vincenzo Scamozzi, another important architect uh, active in, in, in Venice. Uh, here, here he was. I'm not going to go in details now, although I have a presentation about him, just about him, but I will, I will, I will, um, uh, I will um, uh, show it uh, when the day comes, the day when he was born or the day when he died. Procurazie Nuove, the new, pro, I don't know how to translate into English uh, the word, uh, I know in Romanian, Procuratura, but I don't know in English. Procurazie Nuove, it's in the, in the, the, in the San Marco uh, uh, Square. So Scamozzi moved to Venice in 1581, where he had been invited to design the Procurazie Nuove on the Piazza San Marco itself. The Procuratie Nuove was built as a row of official housing for the Pro Procuratorate, Procuratorate of San Marco, presented as a unified palace front that continues the end facade of the Sansovino Library. There are two uh, Procuratios there, the, the old one and the new one. He was to build the new one which is uh, around the corner from Sansovino's library. The Sansovino library was considered by, uh, by Palladio the most perfect, the most harmonious, the most accomplished building since antiquity. But we are going to go there too. So with its arcaded ground floor and arch headed windows of the first floor, but adding an upper floor to provide the necessary accommodation. In accomplishing these designs, Scamozzi adapted a rejected project of Palladios for a refaced Doge, uh, the palace of the Doges, which uh, with colon colonnades that flank the windows to support alternating triangular and arch pediments upon which Scamozzi added reclining figures to balance the richness of the Sansovinian decoration of the, anyway, it's a technical um, text about the building. 11 bays of this project were completed and later were extended by Baltasare Longhena, 
who was Kamotsi's only pupil. So we, we began the presentation today with a pupil, the only pupil or student of Scamozzi, who was Longena, who did the uh, Santa Maria de la Salute, which you saw. Uh, and uh, so this is the building. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures with this. And, and, and this is a, you know, a weakness of my presentation. And that's why I hesitated to, to make this presentation today. Certain section of, sections of my presentation should have been more ample with more uh, information. And maybe I will make another one tomorrow, a, a, a developed uh, presentation. Um, you can miss it because if you are in the San Marco, you see two similar buildings. This one, which is oriented actually towards north, and the one which is oriented towards south. And I was always confused which is which, because one was built by Longena and Scamozzi, and the other one, I don't know by whom. But this one is considered the, the new one, although the other one looks newer. I, I'm a little bit confused, but uh, this is around the corner from the library uh, that, uh, that I mentioned. And, uh, I should have had a plan with a, with a uh, San Marco. What is this? Another building uh, by him, uh, Palazzo Tiene Boni. Uh, sorry, you see, you see, my presentation is is uh, is even inaccurate. This is in Vicenza. Forget it. Actually, this building. So. For those of you who go to Venice to see the Venice Biennial and take the train from Venice to Vicenza, and it's about one hour by train, when you get off the train station, this is probably the first building that you see by Palladio. It was designed by Palladio, as it is written here, he worked on a previous project by Palladio, but uh, uh, the project was done by the architect we talk about now. Uh, Forget it, this is in Vicenza and it's my, my mistake. Uh, the library of San Marco in Venice was a completion of Jacobo of San Sovino's design. And this is the building that Palladio considered the most accomplished, the most beautiful, the most harmonious since the antiquity. This is incredible. I mean, you know, 1,500 years at least were erased by Palladio in his assessment of this building, which was designed by San Solvino, but um, was, uh, was accomplished by uh, Scamozzi. This is the building. So the Procuratio, uh, the, the old uh, procurorate, I, I, I don't know how to translate this in English, is this building here around the corner from the library. And this is the building that Palladio had the greatest admiration for. A prestigious location, no, oh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> this tower, uh, maybe you know, the, this is a, a more recent um, erection, so to speak, because it, it, it fell. I don't know uh, for what reason, maybe because of fire and it was rebuilt. The Church of San Nicolo da Tolentino, this is an interesting building actually. Uh, it's interesting because this is more like a Roman architecture, and a, a temple. You, you wouldn't uh, associate it with, uh, with Venice, but it is in Venice. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by it, actually. It's a little bit confusing uh, for me as well, you know, because there are these architects, Scamozzi, and uh, I mean, uh, and uh, somehow to my mind comes also Savonarola, who was not an architect. And uh, 
I, I, I have some struggles to, to, to uh, I go through some struggles to even uh, not to make mistakes, uh, to remember their names correctly, because this is uh, Scamozzi. Sc we are talking about Scamozzi now, but then we have, we have this, uh, this building by um, uh, San Sovino, which was completed by Scamozzi. So let's, let's, let's make sure that we understand correctly. This library that was so admired by Andrea Palladio was designed by Sansovino, but it was completed by Scamozzi. Now, you know, if you are good with names, you have no problems. But if you are not good with names, it's very easy to mix them up. You know, Sansovino did the design and Scamozzi finalized the work, completed it. If you ask me in a few minutes, I, I'll probably have to think a little bit. Sansovino did the design, but Scamozzi completed it. I should repeat this a few times. Sansovino did the design, but Scamozzi completed it. Sansovino did the design, but Scamozzi completed it. Sorry for being childish. Uh, so this church by uh, Scamozzi, which I find intriguing because it looks like a temple and it's more like a Roman architecture than a, a, Vien uh, than a Venetian architecture. But for this very reason, I find it provocative and interesting and should be seen by someone who goes to Venice and spends a few days there. The interior as well, and it's not bad, is it? Okay, we move forward. So we, we saw Scamozzi, and uh, this is also an interesting work by Scamozzi, uh, San La Lazaro de Mendicanti Church and Hospital. And I like this very much that there is a meeting that, that there, is, there are two functions, the church and the hospital, and they actually together. And uh, you, you know, uh, maybe this should happen everywhere in the world to have a hospital that is a part of the church because you know, the one who suffers does need, you know, the, uh, the encouragements, let's, let's call them so, of the churchmen. So this is the building by Scamozzi. I don't know where is the hospital, maybe here, maybe it's part of the, you know, the frontal, uh, uh, the continuity, the, the urban, um, you know, uh, front. Somewhere here is also the hospital, but the, the, the elevation of the church is this one. Also Scamozzi. San Giorgio Maggiore, he completed also Palladio's um, uh, famous work, San Giorgio Maggiore. So the, the facade, the elevation was actually uh, built by Scamozzi. I'm talking about this, the elevation of the great building by Andrea Palladio. Now this campanile should not make you think that you are, that here is San Marco, it's not. This is across the water from San Marco. So this is San Giorgio Maggiore and, and the facade of the building, the elevation was built by Scamozzi. Palazzo Contarini uh, on the Canal Grande, also by Scamozzi. There are other works, I didn't include everything because it could be very tiring and confusing. Uh, you know, I just show a few works. So this is one of those famous, uh, uh, you know, uh, palazzos that uh, adorn both sides of the canals in Venice. Okay, now Jacopo Sansovino. Jacopo Sansovino who designed that magnificent library that so much was admired by Andrea Palladio. And Sansovino did the design, we remember, but it was completed by Scamozzi. Uh, this is uh, not it, it's not the library, it's uh, another building that he built in Venice. And here is, you know, the, another weakness of my presentation that I don't have enough works by Sansovino uh, shown in this presentation. And this is the library 
that uh, obtained from uh, Palladio so much, uh, uh, you know, admiration. So it was designed by Sansovino, but it was completed by Scamozzi. Now, Carlos Scarpa, now we go, we go to architects closer to us, modern architects. And Carlos Scarpa taught at the, at the University of Architecture in Venice, which is the only university of architecture in Venice and in, in, in Italy. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if it was unfo an unfortunate event because he didn't have a diploma as an architect. Carlos Carpa was obliged to teach drawing and interior design, uh, interior architecture. Uh, but uh, as you well know, um, Carlos Scarpa was one of the major architects of the 20th century. And uh, here he is, Carlos Scarpa, il maestro in metamorphosis. Um, he died at 73 in mysterious circumstances. I read a few accounts uh, that he, he fell from a building in, in Japan or that he fell on a staircase in Japan or that he fell on the staircase on the stair from the plane that landed in, in Japan. So obviously it was in Japan, but exactly how he died, if he fell from the seventh floor of a building or he fell, um, I don't know, on what stair or staircase um, that I couldn't, uh, I I couldn't uh, find out. Also what is very strange and unique probably, maybe it's not unique, maybe in the past other people did it, but apparently he is buried vertically in the in the Brion Cemetery, uh, his famous work. Now I don't know if at the age of that uh, private cemetery or part of the cemetery, but I read he was he's buried uh, in in a vertical position. Strange, no? Anyway, he was a remarkable architect, truly one of the best, together with uh, his friend Louis Kahn. The entrance to the architecture school, the University of Architecture in Venice was done by him. And this is it in, uh, in uh, exposed concrete. And here on the left, it's written uh, verum ipsum factum in Latin. And uh, the, this, uh, you know, the, this wording was used by Kenneth Frampton when he made a, a very nice presentation about Carlos Scarpa many years ago at Columbia University in New York with a conference that which I attended. And what, what does it mean, uh, verum ipsum factum? I hope I get it right. It's something like only through, I mean, through making you arrive at truth, through making. And in a way, it makes sense for a university of architecture to, uh, you know, because you can't have architecture without making. But I think I simplified a little bit, uh, or maybe more than a little bit, the meaning of this wording in Latin, verum ipsum factum, is through the factuality of making that you arrive at truth. And this is what uh, Carlos Scarpa chose to inscribe in, in, in this part of the, uh, of the, this rather elaborate uh, entrance into the School of Architecture. I don't know if you know, Carlos Scarpa has 11 letters in his name, if you add all of them. And apparently he was very fond of number 11. And apparently he used number 11 often in his works. So as you can see, there is subjectivity and even idiosyncratic uh, you know, uh, choices in, uh, there are in, 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 in the works of uh, brilliant minds. Because a brilliant mind is not just an objective mind, it's a it's a human mind, it's, a, it's, it's complex, it's warm, it has imperfection, it has idiosyncrasies. So why not have an architect who uses number 11 often in his work because there are 11 letters in his name? 
Why not? Even Peter Eisenman, you know, he claimed that if he if he um, played with the with the with the letters of his name, he would get instead of Eisenman amnesia. Well, it was more like a wishful thinking because it's not quite amnesia, but it's close enough. Here you see um, uh, verum ipsum factum, uh, you know, with this special graphic uh, or font that uh, Carlos Scarpa used for this entrance into the University of Architecture in Venice. Again, the only University of Architecture in Italy. Querini Foundation, an important work by um, uh, Scarpa in Palazzo Querini Sampalia, an existing palazzo which he, uh, to which he contributed with his own design. This is a bridge that goes into the building and uh, it's, it's a beautiful bridge, you know, truly verum ipsum factum. It is, I mean, uh, Kenneth Frampton talked about the adoration of the joint. Well, you see here, you know, every part contributes to the whole through the thirdness of joining and the joining the way he brings the parts together through through a joint is shows a great uh, mastery and artistry. Uh, you can observe this in in, in 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 most of his works, if not all his works. And unfortunately, in fact, I would like to comment polemically uh, to oppose this beautiful uh, bridge to the much larger bridge that uh, Santiago Calatrava built in Venice, and you are going to see it. Here, Scarpa shows himself as a superior architect to Calatrava because of his uh, sens complex sensitivity and attention to detail, and in particular, because of his interest in, in the art of joinery. He joins like the, 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 the old uh, Japanese craftsmen with a great respect for material and for that uh, almost metaphysical uh, the complexity of bringing two elements together through the, in, through the uh, negotiation or the, 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 um, the, the, I don't know how to say, maybe a negotiation is, the, is not correct word. The, uh, the, the service, the, the, the intermediate service of a third element. And this third element, we do not use any longer in architecture. For example, in, in classical architecture, the classical orders of architecture, you had the column, no, of the classical orders. Well, the column at the base where it touched, you know, the, the, uh, the platform on which the building was built, it had a base. It was not just a cylinder that was straight the same way from the bottom to the top. And then it had the capital at the bottom, at, at, the, at the top. So between the verticality of the column and the horizontality of the structural element that supported the roof, it was a third element and that was the joint. But we don't care about joining these days. Carlos Carpa did. Uh, this, small bridge is a lesson in architecture and is, a, uh, is also a lesson in craftsmanship because uh, in our rush, we, we cover the earth with uh, lots of buildings, but uh, we, we do not take the care. I mean, look what's going on here, just, just here. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. The, everything is studied. It's all about the intimacy of uh, bringing together two elements in a sensitive way. And uh, we are going to see this also later because of, of, of uh, other works that he did for this uh, special, uh, uh, you know, foundation, this, uh, this, found, uh, this foundation. Look, at, look what's going on here. I mean, <laughs> this is beautiful. I mean, it's artistry, you know, it's, you know, most architects would have just had a straight you know, a uh, rail here, that's it. Or here just have a straight, you see the third element I was trying to talk about, you know, 
you have continuously a two-ness, two-ness, two elements, two uh, vertical elements metal, in metal. Then a third one in between that reaches towards another pair of elements or entities, this time uh, you know, almost horizontal, almost because this is, they are not perfectly horizontal, but you see there is an angle. For example, this angle here is not 180, but probably 170 degrees. I mean, these are subtleties. This, this is art. This is art. And uh, <laughs> such sophistications we do not care about, most of us. In the interior, even this uh, rather sinuous, although using a, almost a strict geometry of the steps, it's, it's meandering inside the foundation. Um, uh, no, the, the architecture of Scarpa is, is magical. Look, look what's happening here on the left. Why did he need these erosions, if I am to call them so? I mean, it's an erosion that is geometrical with a, you know, a clear cut uh, geometry. Because it's a continuous attempt to unite the interior with the exterior or two elements, you know, one is hidden, but not completely hidden. Uh, it's behind what we see. So it's a continuous play with the two, it's like a hide and seek architecture. Very interesting architect, Carlos Carpa. The gardens of the, of the garden of this foundation also has beautiful uh, events, architectural events, and we are going to see them. But I like very much what I see here. Do you see this little corner where he uh, allows this opening to extend a little bit towards the other one with this little square, this cut that problematizes this corner and the same happens here. So here you almost see uh, uh, um, a lap sonata between two openings. It's this one, and then this one, and these two little squares, they long for each other. It's, 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 it's magical. It's, it's like there is an erotical attraction between these two, you know, openings. Should I call them o windows in this, you know, rather cubicle? Uh, I don't even know what is happening here, but... <laughs> I mean, these, these things are, are, they are playful, but they are also serious. And they bring sensitivity to, to the work. I don't know if I did justice to the, to the uh, magic work, magical work of Carlos Carpa through my spontaneous uh, uh, wording, but um, uh, I, I let you decide if, if, if the work is uh, ins inspirational or not. I think it's very inspirational. And we are going to see other examples from this very work. I mean, look here. You know, it's, it's the way he works with water is as magical as uh, the way uh, the, 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 I cannot call them builders, the, the gardeners or the, the landscape designers of, uh, um, Granada of Alhambra uh, did because when I visited Alhambra, I was more seduced by the, the incredible uh, complexity and lyricism and poetry and beauty of the gardens and especially the way the water was channeled, just like in Carlos Carpa, than the, than the building itself. Uh, look here, it's an event. It's an event, the way he very affectionately brings water from that channel into that, uh, um, you know, uh, basin, uh, you know, round as it is. When I wrote once an essay on Carlos Carpa, I referred to Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, the great Chinese mystic who left a beautiful, very short book called the Tao where he claims that what, what, is, what apparently is weak is in fact strong. And he gave us an example, water, which compared to the rock or to the stones, by all means appears to be very weak. But the truth is 
the so-called weak water erodes the stone in time. And so what I'm trying to say is we, we like to differentiate between people, between institutions, between uh, all kinds of entities and say this is strong and this is weak. Even, uh, even in, 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 in the dialectics between men and women, we call uh, the, you know, the woman the weak, the, you know, the weak sex. It, it, she's not weak at all. In fact, Napoleon, you know, the great emperor who, who was not afraid of anyone and who won so many battles, he said the only victory in front of a woman is to run away. So who is weak here? You know, and the water, which appears to be weak in time, erodes the strongest rock. I suggest to you, if you didn't already, to read the beautiful short thin book left by apparently by Lao Tzu praising weakness. That weakness, which is in fact real strength, but the appearance seems to say it's weakness. The Tao, very, very nice uh, uh, mystical uh, writing, but you have to be lucky to, uh, you know, to, to come across a good translation uh, of that work. The legend has it that uh, when uh, all the Lao Tzu or Lao Tse, because the, the, his name is translated in, and pronounced in different ways, when he tried to leave uh, the imperial city in China, uh, the guard, uh, the, the exit of the city said, I will not let you leave until you put down your wisdom in a little book, in a book. And so that's how apparently the legend has it that the Tao came into being. A beautiful book, which actually saved my life uh, at one point with its wisdom. Anyway, but again, let's contemplate the subtleties of Carlos Scarpa because we can learn a lot from him. And if we also can read Lao Tzu about the same time from uh, Lao Tzu or Lao Tse and Carlos Carpa, we can uh, obtain rich, riches. Tadao Ando. Uh, Tadao Ando, who was not Chinese, who is not Chinese, of course, but Japanese, but still uh, wisdom comes from the East, where the sun rises. Punta de la Dogana Museum. Well, I already talked a little bit about it is that building which I couldn't enter because I was stingy and I didn't want to pay 25 euros in order to, 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 to see it. It's an art gallery, a museum. I don't know if he created this um, carpentry uh, at the top, you know, the, maybe it was existing or he just refurbished it. It's very nice. But the columns, I don't know what to think of these columns. You know, the, in, for my taste, they are a little bit uh, too designed, a little bit pedantically designed with the uh, rounded corners. Um, maybe they, they were existing like this, although I doubt it. Uh, on the right, we see his signature concrete, polished as it is. I think he, he um, and I, I don't know. I mean, he's a monomaterial architect almost. Although paradoxically, I don't know if you know, um, Tadao Ando lives in a wooden house. The house he lives in is made of wood, not of concrete. It's the old house where his parents lived and where he grew up and he continues to live there, but not in a concrete building. Anyway. But he's not afraid of uh, rawness or roughness. We see he left the bricks here like this, and, and, and that's good. So it's an art gallery, you know, it's a museum, a small museum in a way. I'm not convinced about the glass parapets. They are too sleek and too mundane and too too common actually, like, like, in a, like in a supermarket, you know, or an airport or and they don't have character. And I, I, I'm sorry to say it, but uh, I'm a little bit tired of seeing uh, glass parapets everywhere, you know. 
for balconies, for stairs, for whatever. Everybody uses glass uh, parapets. I, I find it banal. Doesn't matter how well executed, as I'm sure it is here. And also the fact that you don't see any kind of uh, vertical support system because this glass is so strong that it doesn't need them. But if you compare this with the work that bridge, remember by Carlos Scarpa, in fact, you cannot compare them. Uh, Carlos Scarpa would have never used such a handrail or a parapet. And now we are outside of the building. He probably designed also the, the you know, the metallic work for the, for the doorways. And, uh, and 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 for the for the windows, and they are nice actually, and I like the fact that they are woven. I don't know if they belong to Tadao and or, or to the existing building prior to his intervention. Anyway, it's the only architectural work by Tadao Ando in in Venice. So the entrance is here. Be prepared to pay. Uh, well, some years ago, it was 25 euros the interest. And on the right is Longena with his uh, Santa Maria de la Salute, the first building that I showed in this presentation, a short walking distance. Again, this glass turns me off as it is, because it is banal. In my opinion, it is banal. Doesn't matter how well executed. And it is a well executed. I, I prefer the carpentry, uh, you know, because the carpentry of the roof is uh, shows a complexity. It's sculptural. It's, it's tectonically richer. It's not mundane. I don't know who painted the paintings. Alvaralto, because Alvaralto built himself a, a building, a, a pavilion in uh, in Venice at the Venice Biennial on the grounds of, of where the Venice Biennial takes place. This is the model of the building. And to my shame, I never made the time to study carefully the building. And it's a little bit mysterious to me what these triangles do. I almost felt tempted to think that they're actually sliding. Uh, and it is a little bit confusing because it has two triangles. This is the larger one, and there is a smaller one. Like here, you know, it's, uh, I, I am a little bit confused about this building and I, I visited it, but I never never studied it to, to, to really understand what is the meaning of these triangles. Alvar Alto was a very serious architect. I don't think he just, you know, adorned the building with the, these triangles without any, function or without any meaning no it's just that i don't know i don't know how it works i see in the section the way he brings the the light inside the pavilion and it's very nice but i, I have a hard time to imagine that those triangles uh, are just a formal uh, you know uh, connection with the with the lighting system uh, that the, the pavilion has What do they actually do? They must do something, these triangles. I have to solve this mystery. Maybe I will solve it by tomorrow. Anyway, this is the Finnish pavilion at the Venice Biennial, built in 1953 by Alvar Aalto. And the interior, white walls. I'm, sometimes I'm a little bit tired of these white walls. I know all galleries and all museums have white walls because it's convenient, but now you see this triangle here is different from the one here. And I'm sure it doesn't modify its, its geometry. I wonder what Alto wanted to say with this. Finlandia, Finland. Finland, which had the courage 
until very recently to have a prime minister, a young lady who also liked to dance, like other normal people, so to speak. And she was brought down because of her, uh, you know, uh, normality. And now she's even, uh, she filed for a divorce from her husband, maybe because, you know, she fell from power on, I don't know. Strange how the human destiny is. This is the plan of the building by, by Alvarado. Santiago Calatrava, I mentioned him because of a almost disastrous uh, bridge that he built. And I, I, I stepped on that bridge uh, several times and I, I felt uncomfortable functionally, but also aesthetically. I don't think Calatrava understood Venice. Ponte de la Constitucione, which I understood uh, very recently received a uh, um, you know, uh, a refurbish, refurbishment of some sorts. Uh, but the people of, in Venice protested against this bridge very vehemently. I read, and you can read too on the web, protests of the Venetians against the, the bridge by uh, Calatrava. It's a bridge that is, uh, you know, like he does, his architecture is. Uh, you know, expressionism technique, as it was called his architecture, but it's too big, it's too, again, if you compare, I mean, you know, the dimensions were in, obviously uh, uh, determined by the, the width, uh, you know, of the canal, but um, um, it's something about the bridge that, that makes me um, uneasy and, and makes me also wish to compare it with the bridge by Scarpa, which is much more modest, is not flamboyant, but is very subtle and, uh, and, and, and very complex in its, uh, in its uh, uh, modest uh, dimension. This one has big dimensions, but it's, I think it's prosaic. It's Maybe for a North American city it would have worked or some other city, especially a new city. But you don't build something like this in Venice. In, on the other hand, I, the task was difficult because you know it had to be a big bridge, but you could have made it more sensitive through details, through, I don't know. This, this is, and I'm only talking about um, aesthetical elements, but it had uh, uh, functional problems. Uh, people fell on, on this bridge. Underneath is kind of nice, no? Like the carpentry in the work by uh, Tadawando inside that uh, foundation or museum that we just saw. But here again, we see the same uh, glass parapet, simplistic as it is, just like Tadawando used. Uh, anyway. Um, you can read about it on the web and maybe tell me tomorrow, if you attend tomorrow as well, uh, what exactly the people of Venice protested against. I, uh, I used to know, but I forgot the details of the protest. They were very unhappy with this bridge. And you can see in this picture that this bridge has nothing in common with the city. It, it, it doesn't belong to Venice, really the way it was designed. And I'm not saying again that it, it was an easy task. It was not, but I don't think he found the solution, Calatrava, building for Venice uh, this kind of bridge. Rem Kolhas. Kolhas, not Kulhas. I asked once a stewardess in a plane uh, how to pronounce correctly his name, and she, he, she said something like this, Kolhas, Kolhas, not cool house. But you can play with his name uh, and, and create out of his 
family name Kulhas, Kulhas, uh, divided into Kul House. Kul House. Uh, yesterday I had a strange thought of, um, you know, founding something, uh, um, you know, by the way of Bauhaus instead of Bauhaus to have Bauhaus, Bau chaos, chaos, Bau chaos or Bau house in Romanian, Bau house, not Bau house, but by, but by Bau house. What kind of architecture school that would be? Bau house. Anyway, forget it. Cool house, Mr. Cool house, Mr. Ram Cole house, Cole house. Fondaco, the foundation, I guess, Fondaco de Tedeschi. That's where he did some work inside because the building existed. This is the building. And um, I don't know. I was never a great, great, great fan of uh, Rem Kolhas, but uh, you know, he, he's, uh, he doesn't uh, make uh, great mistakes, but there is a certain cynicism in my opinion, his designs as sleek and mundane as they are. Although he is uh, quite capable of, uh, of, uh, of uh, attracting attention, uh, here you almost uh, feel that there are some echoes from his arch enemy, Louis Kahn. Well, Louis Kahn was not his arch enemy, but I've heard Louis, I've heard the Rem Kolhas in a lecture uh, saying never again, never again, when he referred to Louis Kahn. I think he hates Louis Kahn, but here I see echoes from of the Exeter Library by Louis Kahn, right here. I don't know if it was conscious or unconscious, but as it was said, we become what we hate. But I prefer these parapets designed by um, you know the office by Oma, the office of uh, Rem Kolhas, then you know, the glass parapets uh, of uh, Tadao Ando or Santiago Calatrava. The ceiling, not bad, but some drama here. Maybe you see the old and the new within the building where Cole has, um, you know, uh, exercised his metier if I am to call it so. And the water is Venice after all, wherever you look. I like the, the I don't know what they are here. Are they doors or whatever they are? Uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, openings uh, treated in this way. I think here, Colchas is more sensitive actually towards Venice than, than Santiago Calatrava. He created something new, but uh, without insulting the city. Yeah, I think, I think uh, here and there he, he, he did and does some good work. James Sterling. James Sterling built a bookshop uh, a pavilion at, uh, on the grounds of the Venice Biennial. Uh, the bookshop pavilion is this one by, um, by uh, James Sterling. And it's rather interesting. And the, the inside is also uh, uh, not to be ignored. As you can see, the structure of the roof is, uh, you know, creative and, uh, you know, clear cut and, uh, and yet complex. I like it. So if you visit the Venice Biennial, you can't miss it. And if you want to buy a book, I would advise you not to because you can find in Vicenza a second-hand bookstore. Well, actually, they have new books, but with prices probably one third of what you would pay, or a quarter of what you would pay in Venice in this very bookshop designed by James Sterling. Uh, well, James Sterling and Michael Wilford, because he didn't work alone at that time. He worked with Michael Wilford, but still. I wouldn't make a terrible mistake if I said this is a building by James Sterling. And here you see the section. I don't know if he did his drawing or not, or his office, James Sterling and Michael Wilford. Alvaro Cesar. 
Well, to be honest with you, Alvaro Siza disappointed in me here in Venice. I had seen this building, it's social housing. That is economical housing. But why does economical housing to be so, why does it have to be so cold and so uh, oppressive in its uh, regularities and in, in its, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, whiteness even. Housing in Campo di Marte were also uh, Aldo Rossi and Carlo Aimonino built something, but I, I had no time to include the works because it was a little bit confusing also um, what exactly Aldo Rossi did and what exactly Carlo Aimonino did. I understood this um, project, the housing, social housing that these architects worked on was not completed. But you are going to see the building by Alvaro Siza. Is this one? Well, I almost felt like saying, sorry, Mr. Siza, white fascism. You know, it's. I think Siza can do better. And he's drawing some more, more lyrical. Yes, there is this little extravaganza at the top. But otherwise, the building is, and strangely, I, I took these pictures from a, an article which uh, talked about the neighboring, the neighboring of Aldo Rossi, Carlo Aimonino, and Carlo Scarpa. What name, neighboring, you know? I mean, I, I would feel depressed to live in this building. Sorry. And you are going to see some pictures that might even shock you. Because uh, you know, Venice is not just about beauty and art and architecture and biennials and the red carpets for uh, you know the prizes, the Golden Lion, uh, the film festival or art festival or architecture biennial. No, there is another Venice, and you are going to see a few pictures of that other Venice. Here, look at it. In the poorest uh, neighborhood in Bucharest, you would see something like this. This is in Venice. This has nothing to do with Longena and Santa Maria de la Salute, nor with the Venice biennials, not with the glamour of the rich and famous, not with the red carpet, although there is some redness here on a bed sheet of some sort. And this is not actually the most depressing part or photograph of the building by Scarpa, by uh, Alvaro Siza, but this one, look, someone is actually, well, maybe he's not sleeping, but he could be, he could be sleeping. Maybe, maybe he has in his hand, uh, you know, a mobile phone, it's possible. Anyway, this is the building by, by Carlos Scarpa that he built in Venice. So there is another Venice, and that other Venice probably should not be forgotten. Uh, and Aldo Rossi, I had no, uh, I will stop here because I had no time to, I wanted to talk about Rossi as well in Venice and uh, Le Corbusier because he made a, a, a project for Venice, which was not built a hospital, but I had no time to uh, go through this. And also Peter Eisenman, who had an interesting, uh, uh, project for, uh, for, for Venice, which was not uh, built. That's it for today. So um, let me see, because I'm, I'm confused now. Something happened here.